yes sir yeah. we can start okay ma'am थैंक यू फॉर एक्सपेक्ट accepting our invitation and it's an honor to introduce you ma'am actually my name doesn't need any introduction uh, she is known for her humble gesture and uh, kind heartedness uh, dr uh, shweta gaur she done her medicine and M- ms in obstetrics gynecology and fms frn cog from australia and masters in reproductive endocrinology and infertility from australia and she is a director of fertility and gynecology southern germ hospitals hyderabad and formerly a director and consultant at fertility specialist at pivot medical center perth australia and she is a member of ifs icer isre fsa asrm and her contributions to fertility sphere is she is the author in ifs e bulletins childhood cancers and fertility preservation hypogonadotropic hypogonadism and she is a author in chapters in icer ifs foxi ACE consists best practice recommendations for infertility management and there is best practices and research in clinical obstetrics and gynecology and she is a course director for IMA uh, AMS fertility fellowship program at Southern Gem Hospital and she is a invited faculty at numerous national and international fertility conferences and she is a faculty at hands on hysteroscopy workshops across various states in india uh thank you ma'am thank you very much for your giving your valuable time uh coming to it is proven that fact that high quality oocytes results in high quality embryos that are capable of surviving the stages of development to end up as a successful pregnancy and oocyte quality is a one of the key factors that determine the success of the ivf cycle so now without wasting much time i turn over the time to dr shweta gaur ma'am to talk on oocyte quality and its importance over to you ma'am thank you thank you so much uh, so meshwar for your kind words so uh, as the topic for today we'll just talk briefly on uh, oocyte quality and uh, the importance so as we know the oocyte it's the female gamete or the germ cells and uh, it is carrying a set of chromosomes which is contributed from the female it's you know it's got a haploid set of chromosomes one set of chromosome comes from the male and uh, another set comes from the female so it's carried the genetic material and uh, then it's going to create a right environment to enable the process of fertilization by the sperm and also the oocyte is going to provide nutrients for the growing embryo until it sinks into the uterus and the implantation happens and the placenta takes over so oocyte has a lots of role to play and then so when oocyte has got so many roles to play the quality of the oocyte is very very important so the oocyte quality is defined by the ability of an egg to undergo complete process of meiosis undergo the process of fertilization produce a healthy embryo which has a potential to progress to blastocyst either in vivo or in vitro and implant to produce a healthy offspring so oocyte has got uh, uh, the the egg which is there the quality of the egg is very important uh, factor which we always look at whenever we talk about uh, ivf cycles and ivf treatments the egg quality is of prime importance it's very important to have a good quality egg so when we talk about oocyte quality what is the quality what are we looking at when we talk about the quality we are looking at the potential of the egg to be fertilized so whether the egg is been able to be fert- uh, it's just the fertilization of the egg or making a good quality embryo or to lead to a pregnancy all of that is rooted back to the oocyte quality or is it oocyte quality is just to have a chromosomally normal or a euploid egg 
to give a euploid embryo or an aneuploid embryo, is it that just the chromosome number which is important or the oocyte quality uh, is going to impact the early embryonic mm -hmm. development, the establishment and maintenance of pregnancy, the fetal development and even the adult disease. So what, where all the oocyte quality comes into play? So when we talk about uh, the oocyte quality, it's very important, you know, it goes back to the time from embryogenesis. It goes back to the time of embryogenesis where the oocytes are laid into the ovary. So at birth, the, we have a large number of oocytes, but all of these oocytes do not reach to the potential of ovulation. Not all the oocytes which are there reach the potential of ovulation, a number of them undergo a process of atresia during the process of the follicular growth and development. So it's very important that this atresia either can happen very early in the, uh, it, uh, even before the girl reaches her puberty or also from puberty up to menopause also, a large number of oocytes are going to undergo the process of atresia. So what happens, so the, uh, the, basically when we are talking about the oocyte growth or oocyte development, uh, there are two phases of growth, okay. One is a pre antral stage. So the antral stage of the oocyte is when you see the antral follicles, which we see on an ultrasound. They are between two to five mm size antral follicles, what we are seeing on a ultrasound. These, uh, that is an antral, from the antral follicle stage up to the pre-ovulatory stage, which is the, uh, just before the process of ovulation. Then the other phase is from the primordial phase to just the pre-antral, pre-antral follicle stage. So the early phase from the primordial follicle stage or up to the antral follicle stage, this phase is gonadotrophin dependent, uh, is gonadotrophin independent. So the growth of the follicles in this phase happens even in the absence of gonadotrophin. So even if there is no gonadotrophin, uh, there is a growth and development of these follicles will happen. But once they have reached the antral follicle stage, at that stage onwards, the growth is more dependent on the gonadotrophins. Okay. So the early, that is the resting phase or the early phase of the oocytes, which is from the primordial follicle up until the, the, the growth from the primordial follicles up until to the phase of the pre follicles. That particular phase takes up to 300 to 365 days. So this particular growth is dependent, which is independent of the gonadotrophin takes a quite a longer uh, phase and from the antral follicles to the pre-ovulatory phase it takes about 50 to 60 days so that is the time frame of the growth of the oocyte so the very early stage of the follicles from the primordial stage primary secondary and the tertiary tertiary follicle stage it takes about 300 to 365 days and from the antral to the pre-ovulatory follicle takes about 50 to 60 days. So when we have to understand the importance of the oocyte from the embryological point of view, from the point of view of the embryo, where all it will contribute, what is the contribution of the oocyte when it comes to the embryo? So the actual volume of the embryo until the blastocyst expansion, it depends on the oocyte. The embryo is dependent on the protein synthesis, which is essential for the embryo development comes from the second cell, uh, it comes from the oocyte. The organal formation and the distribution that gives structure, energy and proper metabolism to the embryo until the implantation process. The membrane structure and transport mechanism is dependent on the oocyte. It's the mitosis machinery of the embryo. And also, oocyte contributes to 50% of the nuclear DNA. So nuclear DNA, 50% comes from the sperm, 50% comes from the oocyte, and the entire mitochondrial DNA comes from the oocyte. 
and as we know the mitochondrial dna they are mitochondria are the powerhouse of the embryo of the uh, so the most of the energy is coming or the all the mitochondria are coming from the oocyte so now whenever we talk about the quality of the oocytes the quality of the oocyte is de is determined not only by the nuclear and the mitochondrial genome but the micro environment which is provided by the ovary the pre and the ovulatory follicle which can modify the transcription and the translation processes so the oocyte not only contributes to the nuclear and the mitochondrial genome as such the oocyte but also within the ovary the environment in which the follicles are growing the environment micro environment is also important so um, the clinical application of this is lots of drugs what we are using is to make the micro environment within the ovary good more conducive for the growth of the oocyte works on improving the quality of the oocyte going to the complex picture it's highly unlikely that it can be just a single factor or a mechanism which can adequately indicate the proper developmental competence of the oocyte so there are a number of factors which play a role in the development of the competent oocytes so the oocyte quality also uh, we cannot just define uh, we can define one in the morphological assessment so that's what most what that's what our embryologists do is they look at the oocyte morphology on the day of the ovum pick up and then grade them as gv m1 or m2 but also nowadays we have a lot of non invasive key markers which also can be used as a way to identify the quality of the oocyte so the environment or the culture system in which the embryo is growing can also be used as a way to know the quality of the oocyte so the oocyte quality assessment is based whenever the embryologists look at the uh, the oocytes they look at the cumulus or the corona cells which are present around the oocytes and once they did you uh, denude these cells they look at look at the oocyte morphology they evaluate it under the microscope following denudation they look at the cytoplasm the perivitelline space the first polar body the zona pellucida all of them provide some information about the quality of the oocyte and the stage of development whether it's a germinal vesicle whether it's a m1 or a m2 and also the quality is taken into consideration so basically the oocyte we look at the cytoplasm of the oocyte this is the perivitelline space around the oocyte the polar body and then the zona pellucida all of these are analyzed to conclude how on the oocyte quality and then the nuclear maturity is also evaluated the uh, we must you must have heard about the spindle meiotic spindle so it's possible to evaluate this only once you denude the cumulus cells or the corona cells which are present around the oocyte then the m2 is determined by the presence of the extruded polar body in the perivitelline space and by the absence of the germinal vesicle at the m2 stage the oocyte chromosomes are aligned in the equatorial region of the meiotic spindle so all the chromosomes are aligned in the meiotic spindle the meiotic spindle microtubules they are responsible for proper chromosomal segregation and they are very sensitive to the chemical and physical changes so the changes which uh, the meiotic spindle is highly sensitive to the physical and the chemical changes so this is a very important point uh, from a clinician point of view as a clinician whenever we are doing the ovum pick up and all so that's why the pressures at which we collect the eggs are important so that we do not damage this spindle the handling of the oocytes by the embryologists the changes in the temperature you know maintaining the body temp the temperature of 37 degrees while the collection of the oocyte while handling the oocytes by the uh, embryologists all of that the chemical composition of the culture media all of these are very important from a clinical point of view because the oocyte is very sensitive and the 
meiotic spindle, the spindle which is there is very sensitive to any physical changes, any changes in temperature, any changes in the oxygen levels and the chemical changes. So this is very important and meiotic spindle is a key organelle which is they need, we need to look at. So coming to the normal oocyte, a normal human M2, it is a, it's a round cell and uh, that's the shape. It's got a very clear zona pellucida. It's got a small perivitaline space, which contains just a single non-fragmented polar body. And it's got a pale, moderately granular cytoplasm with no inclusions. This is considered as a normal M2 and a good quality M2. However, majority of the oocytes may have one or more morphological variations. So the critical size of the oocyte is necessary for resumption of the process of meiosis and it's 100 to 120 is the size which is substantial. If the size of the oocytes is too big, if it's a very large oocytes, again, it's an abnormal one. We look at in the cytoplasm for any vacuoles or cytoplasmic inclusions, which are not good. So vacuoles can be in the form of saccules or smooth endoplasmic reticulum clusters. Present of this is not a good thing. And some inclusions like refractile bodies, dark incorporations, fragments or spots or dense granules or lipid droplets, all of these are also not a good idea. So the presence of vacuoles was negatively correlated with cryo survival and also for the developmental competence of the embryos after fertilization. So the embryo, the fertilization rates are poor when you see lots of vacuoles or cytoplasmic inclusions in the oocytes, they are going to have developmental competence is affected. They are poor fertilization rate, poor quality embryos. So there is more incidence of biochemical pregnancy, lowered clinical pregnancy rate whenever we transfer the embryos derived from oocytes with vacuoles. So whenever there are oocytes with these vacuoles, it's not going to give you a good quality embryo and a good pregnancy. And then another paper which said the presence of both vacuoles and inclusions was related to compromised clinical pregnancy rate. And these oocytes have lower fertilization the embryo development is poor. There is higher aneuploidy rates of this embryo. So a good oocyte, a good oocyte is, you know, it's round in shape. It's got a clear cytoplasm. There are no vacuoles, no inclusions, a reasonably sized perivitaline space with a small intact polar body, which is just single and not fragmented. And then this is the zona pellucida. So this is a good oocyte. And then when we see sometimes abnormal oocyte is when we have enlarged perivitaline space. If we see this particular oocyte, the perivitaline space is increased. So it's not a good one. In this particular picture, we can see lots of vacuoles in the oocyte. In this picture, there is a dark cytoplasm. So they are very lower pregnancy rate. When you have uh, a dark cytoplasm, it is going to give you poor quality embryos. This is double zona, hairy zona. If you see, it's a hairy zona. And then again, a granular cytoplasm. And this is a ovum, oval shaped. So that's going to give delayed development. So on the, all in all, having an oocyte, which is not going to be of good quality, is going to give poor implantation rate and higher abortion rate, higher chances of having a nucleoidy. And then coming to the spindle, spindle is also very important. The human uh, oocytes need at least two hours to establish a metaphase two spindle following the polar body formation. And then this particular spindle is going to disappear in telophase one, which is in 40 to 60 minutes. And presence of an abnormal spindle. So we need to have, a this is a paper which uh, looked at the meiotic spindle in oocytes which were in vitro matured and which were in vitro uh, in vivo matured. 
So in in vivo matured oocytes, there is a 61%, uh, 20%. So the spindle formation, the presence of an abnormal spindle was only in 20% of the cases when the oocytes were matured in vivo and 71% had abnormal embryos, abnormal uh, meiotic spindle if it was in vitro maturation. So that's the reason why uh, we want to go for the stimulation until the follicles reach 16, 17 mm size and then go for the trigger. And we, uh, we expect a good mature egg from larger size follicles. But when the follicle sizes are very small, we're going to get uh, immature eggs. And uh, when we try to do in vitro maturation of these eggs, there are more spindle abnormalities compared to the eggs which were already mature when they were collected. So the in vitro maturation embryo eggs, we are going to be having more spindle abnormalities and that's how it's going to result in poor fertilization and poor embryo development. So that's why we want an embryos which are eggs which are mature at the time of collection and in vitro maturation, how much ever good techniques we have, they're not going to give us good quality embryos. So in vitro maturation often produce poor quality oocytes in contrast to in vivo mature, a mature oocyte. So the various morphological, this is a little bit busy slide, but it's just a few papers which are trying to show that if you're going to have a abnormal meiotic spindle, whether it's long or if it's not aligned properly, or uh, it's of high density, if it's uh, befringent, any of these uh, kind of meiotic spindles are going to give us poor results. So uh, along with the oocyte morphology, the meiotic spindle is also very important. So oocyte, the zona pellucida, uh, it's formed by the oocyte during the follicular growth and it's well ordered and structured zona reflects an oocyte which is going to have a good follicular uh, development. So this is uneven befringence. If you see, it's not, uh, uh, it's an uneven zona. It's going to have poor implantation potential and you've got a good, nice, clear zona. It's going to have a better implantation potential. So then this was another paper where they looked at some from human reproduction 2020. 2010, where 706 cycles and they had biopsied about 4,000 oocytes. So they, there was a, they found that there was a significant correlation between the proportion of abnormal oocytes when the female age advances or there are some ovulatory factors, you know, patients with PCO and all, on those patients with endometriosis or the patients with recurrent abortions or a dosage of FSH, what we use and the duration of FSH injections and the, has a correlation with the M2 oocytes. And then uh, the clinical pregnancy, uh, if the oocyte quality was better, there were more M2 oocytes and the clinical pregnancy rate was better if the oocyte quality was good. Then uh, apart from the physical assessment of the oocyte morphology, the metabolic assessment of the oocyte viability is also important. This is a paper from Nagy and his group in Reproductive Biomedicine Online 2009, where 412 oocyte culture samples were taken from 43 cycles and metabolic profiling of oocyte was done from the culture media where the oocyte spent some time. And that showed there was a significantly different quality between the GV, M1, and M2. They were able to predict the embryo development to day three and day five, and this was also related to embryo viability. So the time spent of the oocyte uh, within the culture media and the analysis of that can sometimes be helpful. So the oocyte uh, competence is profoundly affected by the multiple endocrine paracrine, 
and the autocrine factors during oogenesis and follicular development, the importance of which has been highlighted in the culture system. So when we did the analysis of the culture systems, we found that there are a number of factors which play an important role. So here when we focus on the perspective of oocyte secreted factors because of their unique role in coordinating the process of follicular genesis. So in vitro maturation, timing of progression to meiosis two is dependent on the milieu of the culture media and the culture conditions. So in vivo, you're going to have a constant body temperature. It's going to be a dark environment. It's a controlled oxygen, O2 and CO2 levels, the volume of fluid, the dynamic changes in the secretion and free radical scavengers. So there are going to be normal acquisition of methylation markers in the in vivo oocyte. And the main problems what we face in in vitro conditions is the thermal shocks, which the oocyte gets. There is variability of the light, variation in O2 and CO2 levels, volume of the media, and then the cumulus oocyte complex. There's no cumulus oocyte complex connections, vulnerability to the reactive oxygen species and DNA fragmentation. This all leads to the abnormal DNA methylation. So these are the most common reasons why we are not able to get that good quality oocytes in in vitro conditions compared to in the in vivo conditions. These are another few pictures uh, which are showing sorry, uh, there's something wrong with the screen. Is this some, uh, are you able to see the screen, Someshwar? Oh, ma'am, we can see the screen, uh, but we can't see the slides. Uh, okay, yeah. yeah. So uh, uh, they can be uh, as a few other pictures, you know, indicating the oocyte abnormalities. Uh, this, as we said, you know, it's such, it's a normal uh, oocyte with a clear cytoplasm with a single, uh, polar body and a reasonable size perivitula in space and the zona. This is more of a granular uh, cytoplasm. And sometimes we hear our embryologists telling that it's a granular cytoplasm. It's not that good quality oocyte. And then there's the presence of a refractile body and it's an abnormal shape oocyte. Here the perivitula in space is fragmented. The zona is quite thick in this picture. Number of vacuolations are there. It's going to give us poor quality embryo, poor fertilization. There are inclusions like smooth endoplasmic reticulum, irregular zona. There's a larger perivitaline space. Polar body here is fragmented. And the polar body in this picture is large. So all of these are going to give us abnormal oocyte. So multiple morphological, structural, and metabolic parameters taken into consideration whenever we talk about the oocyte. So again, these are multiple abnormal, multiple morphologies. And uh, whenever all of these abnormal morphologies are there, we are going to get poor fertilization and poor embryo development. So after talking about the oocyte morphology, you know, the, uh, which is one of the major determinant factor of the oocyte quality where we rely on the morphological assessment of the oocyte at the time of uh, ovum pickup by our embryologists. So that's the major determinant factor of the selection of the oocytes for doing the process of IVF or uh, ICSI. And apart from the various, uh, uh, there are a number of intrinsic factors which can influence some of the clinical factors which can have an impact on the quality of the oocyte is the polycystic ovaries, the PCOs, which are very common for fertility condition. The various uh, stimulation protocols which we use for the IVF uh, stimulation, the condition called as endometriosis, which is also one of the very common indications for fertility treatments and IVF. And one of the biggest factor is the met advanced maternal age. So we come across lots of patients with 
poor quality in eggs and embryos with advancing age. So what happens with in patients with uh, PCO? As we said that the uh, various hormonal factors, the growth factors, which modulate the FSH and LH action, the various local uh, regulatory mechanisms, they play a very important role within the ovary itself, within the follicle itself. There are uh, a number of uh, uh, my, the, the micronutrients and all, they act at that level. And the microenvironment, uh, which is there within the ovary, which has an impact on the follicular development. So what happens in PCO is there are process of follicular genesis is a bit prolonged. And there is a hyperandrogenic ambience within the ovary because of hyperandrogenic status of PCO due to this, there is an exaggerated response of the granulosa cells to FSH stimulation and poor quality oocyte and lower implantation rate. So molecular abnormalities in oocytes from women with PCO is there, which was revealed in the microarray analysis. So in this particular study, they saw there was differential expression of genes related to the meiotic mitotic cell cycle suggests that the defects in the meiosis and early embryo development could lead to poor embryo development in PCO cases. So although in the PCO patients, you know, in our clinical experience also, we see quite a time that large number of follicles are, uh, they take off, they start growing. And, uh, not, uh, and they're, uh, not all of the follicles are going to give us a good quality. Oocyte. Quite often we may end up collecting 20, 25 eggs, but we may end up with only eight or nine M2, so you know, less than more than 50% can be abnormal. And in a normal patient, even if we collect 10 to 12 eggs, we may have a reasonably good number of uh, M2 oocytes. So the microenvironment within the ovary in patients with PCO has got a big role to play in affecting the oocyte quality. Then uh, 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 conditions like endometriosis, we know. Uh, endometriosis and particularly when we see stage three or three, four endometriosis where there is a, a endometrioma within the ovary. So the follicular environment can affect the oocyte quality and the embryo development. So the and even in mild to moderate uh, cases of endometriosis, also the oocyte quality can be affected because of impaired mitochondrial structure and function. So endometriosis seems to affect the oocyte number and quality more than it affects the endometrial receptivity. As we know, endometriosis has an impact at all the levels, at the level of the oocyte, and also even at the level of endometrium as well. It's going to, patients with endometriosis has lower endometrial receptivity compared to other cases of infertility. So, but the impact is definitely there even on the oocyte quality in patients with endometriosis. And then other intrinsic factors is the age, uh, the advanced maternal age uh, is going to influence the oocyte uh, quality to a significant extent. As you know, the oocyte is arrested in the prophase one. Uh, so as the age advances from the process of prophase one oocyte to the process of ovulation where you have the metaphase two, the egg, the percentage of the normal meiotic spindle is high in younger women. So they're formed after there's a, uh, there are more number of normal meiotic spindle in this group. And this is all related to more to the mitochondria. So it, it's an ATP driven process and you need a lot of energy and mitochondria. And as the age advances, the mitochondria in the eggs is going to go down and it's going to have disruption of the meiotic spindles. So reduce mitochondrial numbers and activity in the oocyte with the advancing age, you're going to have disrupted meiotic spindle. So insufficient energy is available to form or maintain this meiotic spindle. The chromosomal alignment is affected. This leads to aneuploidy and poor embryonic development, more implantation failures, recurrent miscarriages, and birth defects. So this is one of the major factors within uh, women with advanced age is the lower mitochondria, which is there. And mitochondria is the driving force or the energy force uh, for the 
final maturation process of the oocyte and also even in the embryo. The embryo is totally dependent on the egg for the mitochondria. So if the egg is going to have lesser mitochondria with the advancing female age, the embryo is going to have lesser mitochondria and it's going to be a poor quality embryo. And uh, there are a number of uh, drugs, you know, we can uh, discuss which are like coenzyme Q, uh, which we are giving to, uh, uh, to provide the energy for this uh, aged oocytes. So again, uh, as the age advances, the abnormal embryos are going to be more with advancing age. And that's more to do with the mitochondria. And another paper again, reflecting that the live birth rate per embryo transfer is going to reduce with the advancing age, particularly in their late thirties, the problem is more evident. So in women less than 35, about 60% of embryos are euploid. By 40, they are going to be 30% euploid. And by 44, this is going to be only 10% of euploid embryos. So as the age advances, we need more and more number of eggs to get a single euploid embryo. And the problem is with advancing age, the number of eggs are also going to go down. And uh, the oxidative stress and the oocyte quality, we always keep hearing uh, this. And the possible etiologic, etiopathogenic mechanism in mild to moderate endominimal endometriosis is the increased reactive oxygen species in the peritoneal fluid, in the follicular fluid. So there is increasing oxidative stress because of the inflammatory reactions, increased ROS, and then giving antioxidants is going to be useful. So the oocyte quality as it is affected because of the peritoneal, systemic, and follicular fluid, increased ROS. And again, oxidative stress is there in advanced age as well. So in contrast to the in vivo process, the application of ovarian hormone stimulation protocol for IVF, it bypasses the complicated selection procedure which usually happens during the normal oocyte development where there is a maturation of a single oocyte and allows for the natural process of selection. But when you have too many oocytes which are, collect, uh, are growing, the quality can be a bit compromised. So during the natural normal process where you have a single egg uh, developing in a natural cycle, uh, it's a nature selection process where one of the dominant follicle, which has got a good quality embryo, gets all the blood supply, it gets all the nutrient, it gets all the FSH, and others, they do not get it. And then the group of follicles which have started to grow all become atritic. And the one lucky dominant follicle takes off and develops into a mature egg. And that is the nature's natural process of selection to have a good oocyte. But sometimes, but when we are going through the IVF process, we are stimulating by the hormonal stimulation protocol and a large number of follicles are taking off. So sometimes the stimulation process itself can cause a compromised quality and the oocyte quality again depends on the, uh, the drugs and what we are giving and the duration of the stimulation and all matters. So the timing of the follicle development, the standard rate for follicular development is about 1.7 mm per day, and it takes about 10 to 12 days of stimulation, which is ideal. So oocytes from follicles grown at this rate are better quality with better fertilization and better blastocysts. So it's very important to have a growth of group of follicles which are synchronized so that when we trigger, most of them are of good size. Otherwise, we have two different groups of follicles. Uh, one of them will have low smaller size follicles where you will end up with immature oocytes with the uh, lower fertilization and another group will be of larger size so we'll end up getting a reasonably uh, a less number of uh, mature oocyte despite our stimulation so the the protocol and everything what we give uh, does matter and then the lifestyle factors so we cannot uh, the stress hormone reduces the E2, E2 levels, which is also involved in the maturation process of the oocytes. 
the weight we always stress on the weight loss so more body weight is going to affect the hormonal levels and the insulin resistance as well as there's going to be oxidative stress so in 2005 linston had done a large study with more than 8000 women and he found that women who had higher bmi were 33 percent less likely to have a live birth compared to women with normal bmi we cannot stress more about smoking. We all know odds of pregnancy are lower by 50% with smoking and that reduces the miscarriage and fertilization rate. The smoking is going to affect the follicular environment. The micro environment within the ovary is going to be affected and that's going to affect the follicular growth and development. Alcohol, more than four drinks a week, had a 16% lower chance of live birth and a 48% reduction in the fertilization rate. Coming to the diet, the Mediterranean diet is rich in fruits, vegetables, whole grain, nuts, olive oil, and low in red meat. And this is going to be a positive impact on pregnancy. So now having discussed about uh, in the various intrinsic factors compared to the disease, the lifestyle factors. So modification of the various lifestyle factors is very important. Stopping smoking, getting the right weight, and as we say in PCO, even a 10% reduction in the body weight is going to get the hormonal balance good and uh, make the chances of pregnancy better, uh, cut down on the alcohol and smoking. All of this is going to improve the taking the right uh, diet. All of this will help in improving the quality of the oocyte. And we need to uh, work on is the target window for this. Uh, Improvement is we need to act from the primary follicle uh, stage up to the anterior follicle stage. Okay, anterior follicles are the ones which are going to develop into the pre ovulatory follicles and eventually ovulation. So, we, this is the window where we need to act. So, if you're going to give any medication during this particular cycle, this is going to impact on the oocyte quality in the next two, three months. So, Trying to improve egg quality at the end of months long process of egg maturation is not as effective. So we need to act on this much earlier. So we see this is a pool of the primordial follicles in the beginning. And then you, if you see how so many of the follicles which have started to grow, they become atritic and eventually only a single follicle takes off in a natural cycle. And there's an interplay of various local factors, the gonadotrophins and everything, which is going to act at the molecular level. Uh, in the recent Cochrane review in 2017 summarized a large number of supplements to improve the egg quality and give better results. And all of them have some role to play. You know, they are all micronutrients, n cysteine, melatonin, vitamin E is a very good antioxidant, vitamin C. L-arginine, vitamin D, vitamin B, myonestrol, folic acid, Q coenzyme Q10, L-carnitine, pentoxifiline. So all of them are good. Uh, most of them, you know, they are more acting in reducing the reactive uh, oxygen species, improving the oocyte quality at the molecular level. Apart from this, you now we talk. We can talk about drugs such as uh, uh, DHEA, growth hormone. Uh, they are all very uh, lots of drugs which are there. So uh, apart from these drugs, what can be done to improve the IVF outcome is having better stimulation protocols. If we want in advanced age group women, we need to do the pre-implantation genetic testing. The PGTA or PGD can be done. And uh, we have to have good practice in the IVF labs, uh, maintaining the good culture environment, Made, uh, being sensitive and understand the egg collection process and then the environment in which the egg is collected, the importance of temperature maintenance in the lab, the CO2 and oxygen levels, the, the incubators, everything is going to be very important. So we cannot change much the intrinsic quality of the oocyte, but of course the environment in which we are collecting our eggs and the environment in which we are culturing of our embryos are in our hands. So if we have good practice in the IVF lab, 
whatever the quality of the eggs we have, we can try to give the best possible outcome in that quality. And then DHEA is a very much talked about drug. Uh, it's going to uh, cause slightly elevated androgen levels within the ovary and give us uh, probably give a better quality embryos and better pregnancy rate and lower miscarriage rate. Uh, they're also talking about using 1% testosterone gel. So the, there are mixed studies about DHEA. And then there is some a growth hormone is also something which uh, is also becoming quite uh, popular, uh, quite uh, you know popularly uh, used uh, DHEA and growth hormone. All of them is going to act at the molecular level, improving the micro environment within the ovary. Coenzyme uh, Q10 is also uh, very useful in post ovulatory aging. Uh, improves the maturation uh, uh, competence of the oocytes, helps in better fertilizing capacity, and then the it's particularly acting at the level of the mitochondria. So uh, with this, we come to the end of my discussion. So just to summarize a few points, uh, the oocyte quality, uh, it actually determines the intrinsic ability of the oocytes to undergo the process of meiotic maturation, the fertilization, the embryonic development, and the successful pregnancy. The quality of the oocytes is very important. It's got a big major support mechanism for the embryo in the early developmental stage. So the oocyte quality can be determined by the morphological parameters of the cytoplasm, the polar body, the cumulus, the cumulus cells, is routinely used for selection of a mature oocyte in the IVF ICSI process. However, the morphological criteria for grading and screening of oocytes is subjective. So sometimes instead of uh, the, the other things, uh, non-invasive molecular markers for predicting the oocyte competence are available, but uh, we don't use much of these uh, non-invasive markers for the molecular analysis. Most often it's the oocyte morphology assessment by the embryologist is most often used in the IVF process. And owing to the complex mechanism, which is related to the oocyte maturation and uh, acquisition of competence, it's, it's, not like, it's unlikely that a single characteristic can adequate, adequately reflect the quality of the oocyte. So the uh, obtained information about the competence of the oocyte, the morphological assessment should be combined with other approaches. The main factors which are influencing the oocyte quality are the PCO, the stimulation protocols, the endometriosis and advanced age of the mother. So all of these factors, you know, in these patients, we have to be more vigilant about that the quality of oocytes can be affected. We can apply better stimulation protocols and be more careful in this group of patients. So utilization of the most competent oocytes during IVF is crucial to ensure derivation of high quality oocytes and successful pregnancy. So that's why we always talk about the oocyte quality and also uh, the identification of best quality oocytes and embryos will reduce the number of embryos. We can reduce the multiple embryo transfer if we can get, uh, we can identify good embryos. Uh, going to the blastocyst stage, we can do a single embryo transfer and reduce the risk of multiple pregnancy. So with this, we come to the end of our talk. And if there are any questions, we can take uh, Someshwar. Yeah, thank you very much, ma'am, uh, for your excellent and superlative talk. It is always an honor and learning to hear you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, and take the questions from the delegates. Uh, ma'am, we have one question. Uh, that is whether IVF birth rates are same for frozen oocytes as same as fro uh, fresh oocytes? Yeah. Uh, so oocyte cryopreservation is no more uh, experimental process now. Uh, it's now being like a standard technique, like how embryo cryopreservation is considered as a standard technique. Even oocyte cryopreservation is now considered mm -hmm. as a standard technique. It's no more an experimental so yes, the success rate with fresh and vitrified oocytes is very much similar. 
Thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, we have one more question. Uh, ma'am, could you explain how to get a, a competent oocyte uh, with uh, supplements? See, with supplements, uh, uh, most often supplements is what we tend to use as clinicians. Most of us is antioxidants like coenzyme Q and all this combination what uh, is available. And uh, then in patients with advanced stage, we can use uh, either testosterone gel or DHEA. The use of growth hormone uh, during stimulation protocols has increased to give a better quality uh, oocytes. And then apart from this uh, medical treatments, uh, there are a few treatments like uh, autologous PRP. So uh, platelet rich plasma injection in women with advanced age, this is also one of the things which is becoming quite popular to in women with advanced age to improve the uh, number of uh, oocytes, so which can be more competent, which we can get. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, we have uh, one more question, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, that is, is coenzyme Q10 for all? And when to start? See, coenzyme Q10 is not for all. It is more for uh, women like in PCO patients, in endometriotic patients, in patients with uh, advanced age, uh, anyone more than 35. In this particular group of patients, uh, uh, we are expecting the oocyte quality could be poor. So we can put them on coenzyme Q and that could be for a period of two to three months prior to the planned IVF treatment. So, and also the dose, nowadays the recent recommend dose is uh, 300 milligrams twice a day. Thank you, ma'am. We have one more question from Dr. Supriya. Uh, good oocyte quality in PCO patient, what should we give? So yeah, uh, what one, we can give some coenzyme supplements in PCO patients and then uh, we can uh, put them on uh, myonacetol and uh, 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 for a couple of months prior to the planned treatments. So that can also uh, help and uh, of course, our stimulation protocols, we have to be in PCO patients, better to give recombinant FSH than the HMG preparation. So this is something what we try to do to have a better response in the PCO patients because already they have high LH. So the high LH may have an impact also on the oocytes. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, there's a one more question from Dr. Supriya. Uh, the role of growth hormone for oocyte quality. You see, again, with growth hormone, uh, there are mixed reviews. Uh, there's no uh, and studies which are saying that definitely uh, a growth hormone will improve the oocyte quality. There are two different schools of thought. And uh, uh, then also uh, the, what basically growth hormone does, it improves the, uh, the cytokines and the growth factors uh, within the ovary in the follicular uh, environment where the oocyte is growing. So because of the increase in the growth factors and cytokines within the ovary, it's going to help in giving a better quality oocyte is what the theory behind using growth hormone. And then oh, the papers, what we have is uh, very variable. The dosage is of uh, growth hormone used in different studies was different. The protocols which was used was very different. And then we have, and the numbers of patients in these studies were variable. So we don't have good concrete uh, studies for growth hormone, but whatever experience, little experience, what I have with growth hormone, it's been reasonably good. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we have one more question that is uh, vitamin D3 role in oocyte quality. Yes, you're talking a lot about vitamin D uh, deficiency is going to affect oocyte quality, you know. So definitely, uh, are, and most of us uh, as Indians, we are deficient in vitamin D. So it's always a good idea to put the patients, uh, we are relating PCO also with vitamin D. So of course, for supplementing with vitamin D is a very good idea, you know, for all our patients. 
Thank you very much, ma'am. I don't find any additional questions yeah. in the comment box. So if you allow me, then we will close this webinar. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, sure, sure. Sure, Mr. Meshwar. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you once again for your valuable time and uh, very nice talk on the oocyte quality. Uh, we expect you from, uh, again, the forward support regarding this uh, educational initiatives. Thank sure. you very much, ma'am. Yeah, we look forward for your support. Okay. And I thank also you. thank all the delegates who are participating in this webinar. Thank you, Someshwar, and your entire team and the Shield Healthcare to give me an opportunity to connect with so many doctors uh, for giving me an opportunity to talk here today. And I really enjoyed this session. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. And many thanks from the Shield.